All right, how's everyone doing? Good. Okay, we have a couple things before we jump into the Bible study uh, for announcements. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we are entering that time of that season where we have a lot of things transitioning. Now, with the next month, we do have the newsletter available. So keep in mind, the newsletters are where? Newsletters are going to be over by those chairs in the, the um, um, lobby area uh, where the glass doors are. <clears throat> where the glass doors are. Um, it's going to be right on the wall there. So newsletters for the month of September are done. So make sure to grab that. Now, keep in mind, coming up, we have transitioned into confirmation, uh, the confirmation season. So there's going to be some confirmation parent meetings and so forth coming up. Uh, we're going to be having Rally Sunday on September 12th. If my mind is serving me correctly, we'll have a potluck that day. So keep that in mind as well. And so, um, yeah, so just keep, keep kind of aware this is that time of season that things kind of shift as far as changes to, this, to the uh, church calendar and so forth. Um, as far as other announcements here too, just want to mention uh, Kelly is back from deployment and Zach. So welcome back to you guys. Good to see you guys. And so God be praised that uh, you're kept safe and everything. So that's awesome. Also, um, over there, uh, Mr. Joshua Reinke, if you guys make sure uh, to greet him and make sure to be uh, give him a hard time. So Josh Reinke is... Uh, he is the former pastor up at Our Savior's Botno, and then also Willow Creek and Rugby. Uh, he's retired uh, from the ministry. Now, with respect to the churches up there, uh, if he was visiting with me, he thought it would be best for him to be coming to St. Paul's while they seek to have a new pastor up there. It's kind of a good way to pull away, so as it gives, gives him some freedom uh, to choose a pastor. So he said, well, can we transfer here? And I said, well, I'll have to think about it. So I prayed long and hard. <laughs> The Lord told me, <laughs> no, but it's good to have him, and so um, uh, you, it, the habit might be to call him Pastor Renke, but it's just Josh, so Josh Renke, and uh, so make sure to greet him and give him a hard time, okay? So, wonderful. Say, so Josh, just those two guys right there, well, okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the three of you. I'm like, I'm like, watch out, but the next thing you know, I'm just looking at the three of you. I'm like, oh my goodness, what did we create here? It's a perfect spot right between both of them there, Josh. You can sit between both of them. Hey, you're about the three fine men. The three fine men. You notice he didn't say life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> one of you would have gotten slapped, I think, on the head, right? <laughs> All right, so let's pray. We'll jump into Acts 15 here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of your word. We thank you for the clarity of your word. And be with us as disputes arise in your church and as we discern uh, this, con this control center of your word being word and eternal truth for us. Bless our conversation. Uh, bless our thoughts and our uh, wrestling with your scripture this morning. In Jesus' name. Okay, Acts 15, <clears throat> chapter 15, verses 22 through 40. Now, this is going to be a continuation of last week. Now, if you can recall from last week, we talked about the Jerusalem Council. Recall uh, there, were, there were some problems up in Antioch. Uh, Paul was up there with the churches, and there's a big, big dispute. There's a big kind of blow up. So they had what was called a council. They got together. Now, keep in mind, this was no, uh, no discussion of small uh, dis dissension. It was a very, very large dissension, a lot of fighting, a lot of struggles in the church. So they went and they, they formed a council, and that council is where they discerned uh, uh, from the scriptures what is right and true. So this is a continuation of that. So we're going to look at chapter 15, verses 20 through, 22 through 40, It'll be a continuation of that. And we're going to pull out a couple of um, neat little gospel nuggets and a couple of neat things to check out here. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to read this so that those that are watching online can also hear the text too as well. It says, Acts chapter 15, verse 22, it says this, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called a Bar uh, Bars Barsba, boy, how does that? Barsabas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter, the brothers both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, boy, Cilicia excuse me, greetings. 
Since we have heard that some persons have gone off from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by words of, by word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of the encouragement, and Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, and count encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many, other, many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return to visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And they went through Syria and Cecil, uh, Cilicia, excuse me, I want to say the Cilicia, strengthening the churches. All right, cool. Let's look at our sheet. If you have your sheet here, and if not, you can follow along up here. Here's what our sheet says. <clears throat> Perhaps the most important words in our selected scripture in this lesson are from verse 28. So out of everything we read, verse 28 is probably one of the most important words we want to really, really focus on. It says this. It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit in us. These words and Acts 15 have served the church well as being an example of how church councils should work. In other words, the decisions that were made in Acts 15 were not something human. In other words, when theological problems have arisen in the church over the last 2,000 years, problems that were of no small dissension and debate, the church would call together a council to tackle the issue. Now, it is important to keep in mind how doctrinal or practical issues are resolved in the church, especially with the original councils and the various councils that have followed since then. Now, we've got to keep in mind that there are uh, multiple councils that have occurred. You have the Jerusalem Council that began but then you have multiple councils. Now, one of the ones that we're probably most familiar with is the Council of Nicaea. Now, if you hear that word Nicaea, what do you guys think of? Nicene Creed. Nicene, yeah, the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed came forth out of a council. Now, long story short, there was a big dispute among the churches about the identity and the person, the work of Jesus. And so there was a lot of fighting going on. So they convened to have a big council, and they duped it out theologically. Okay, so if you if you imagine like the Super Bowl, right? I mean, how it's 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 all is all all is in. I mean, it's 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 the epitome of football. It's the, the the game of the year. That's kind of what a council is. They all get together. The big hitters come in and they duke it out theologically. Okay, so we've had multiple councils over the last two thousand years to gather together to duke out theological problems and theological dissensions in the church. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so they got together. So first, it is important to recognize that the church did not originate from the will, wisdom, and efforts of mankind. So when we think about these councils, what we have to understand is it is not a gathering of people to have the loudest voice and the loudest voice wins. What is going on in our culture right now? The loudest voice. Unfortunately, what is ending up happening is this. You can have a perfectly rational and clear argument towards something but oftentimes that rational, clear, concise, and well thought out argument will not win in the court of public opinion, but what will win? Whoever is the loudest, okay? So councils, we have to understand, a church council is about what? First and foremost, you have to understand that the church does not originate from the will of mankind. The church is a creation of the gospel, okay? So we are here, not to have some uh, political group. We're not here to have some sort of uh, social club. 
we are here called and gathered because we are the baptized. That, that the gospel has been poured upon us, has been spoken into our ears, and we've been called together for that main purpose of the gospel. Right? So I would hope that everyone is here today. Uh, now it's fine to have friends. I'm not saying you can't have friends. But I would hope that everyone's here for one purpose and one purpose only. To hear from the word and to receive what? Absolution of the Blessed Sacrament. Right? Now it helps if you can have some fun and you know josh around and, and, and make, make some jokes and so forth with uh, individuals. That's completely fine. But the primary focus is what? To be here for the word. And that's what, what creates the church. Okay? Make sense? Any comments on that? What happens if the church does not gather for the purpose of the word and the word alone? I mean, it's a matter of issue of motive, right? So why go to church? I mean, it's a simple question, right? Uh, why go to church? Our answer as Lutherans, as Lutherans is very, very simple. Why go to church? Word and sacrament. That's it. Right? Word and sacrament. It's that simple. And, you know, we can have some fun with some of our friends. But let's just say you don't like anybody in the church. Okay? Let's just say you don't like anybody in the church. Can you still have a reason to go to church? Yeah. It helps if you like people, right? You know, it helps. Um, I recall, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I recall one of my favorite favorite stories that happened. Was I was, it was in one of my churches, previous churches I was serving at. We were not doing well at loving each other. Um, you know, you think our voter meetings here get long? Oh, they were long and there was yelling. I remember one time at a voter assembly uh, that at my one church, I went downstairs to use the restroom and I saw a poor mother hiding in the nursery with her child. And I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I changed the diaper and I just stayed down here. <laughs> she didn't want to go upstairs because the, 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 the voters assembly. So I remember one day this, this couple came in and they were all, you know, like new, a new couple coming into the church. And usually you can tell when people are new what are they, when they come in the door, what do they look like. They have a big smile, and they just kind of, their eyes are up, and, and you can tell because they're looking around, they're processing everything, right? So we come into the doors, right, and we're used to where everything is, so we're not, like, taking it all in. But if you go to somebody's new house, you're looking up, you're, 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 you're soaking it all in. So you see somebody new, they're, like, looking around, they're soaking it all in. I can tell them, like, this is a new person. And I'm like, oh, no, heaven forbid. We were, we were just in the middle of our, all these fights. And I came up, and they're like, hi, we're new here. And they're shaking my hand. You must be the pastor. Yeah, yeah. And so I sat him down, and I just said, well, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to shoot really straight with you. Uh, we're fighting as a church, and we don't really love each other too well. And frankly, I don't love a lot of these people either. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I said, so just so you know, uh, we're not doing too good on that love scale. Um, but I think you're going to hear Jesus, and you're going to receive Christ in this church and his word and you're just going to see a bunch of sinful people who need Jesus. And they said, okay, thank you. And I thought, for sure, they're going to be gone. You know, Next week they came back, you know what they said? That was the most refreshing thing we've ever heard. <laughs> We're in. We're in, right? Well, it just so happened, what, what were they looking for? They're working, look, looking for the word and sacrament, right? And so I'm telling you that um, I don't have to like Dwayne, and that's okay. <laughs> I like you, Dwayne. I don't know about Wally. I'm still thinking about that. But no, seriously, right? You, you, know, you, you don't have to like the neighbor across, and you may have differences, and, and that's okay. right? They can drive a Ford pickup. You can drive a Chevy. You can, you know, whatever, right? And it's like, hey, we're here because we're in Christ, right? Okay? So, the, so when it comes to the church, the church is created by the word and the sacrament. Uh, what defines the church is the word and sacrament being delivered, and believers gathering around it for that purpose. And the rest is what? The rest is just small details. The rest is gravy, right? Okay? The rest is just secondary. Okay? All right. So the church is created by the word and sacraments, not mankind. And so since the church does not originate from mankind, the authority for the church is none other than the holy writ, God's word. And so let's consider it this way. Top right. What is the control center for the local church? Does it reside with a pastor? How about the suggestions and opinions of the laity? How about culture? Simply stated, the control center for the pastor and church is God's word. Pastors are not to subject their parishioners to anything that is not of God's word. And the congregation cannot expect the pastor to do and say anything apart from the word of God. That which governs the pastor and the church is the word of God. And so unity is had when pastor and parishioners are preaching, hearing, living, and rejoicing in the same word of God. 
Now, what happens when the Word of God is not the control center? So let's just say we're having a big problem here in the church. Let's just say we're having a, um, and maybe even a theological problem. Um, how, how is it handled if the Word of God is not the control center? How would the final decision be made? You'd vote, and whoever gets the most votes would what? Would win, right? Um, unfortunately, what we see in some more of the liberal churches in America and the more liberal churches in, um, in mine here too as well, the reason why we are different, and this is, this is going to sound very arrogant, but this is true. The reason why we are different than them is that I would contend that their view of Scripture is different than ours. So if you believe that the Bible only contains the Word of God and is not the Word of God, right? So what's the difference? The Bible is the Word of God or the Bible contains the Word of God? Is there a difference there? <laughs> Tremendously. Now, <clears throat> the, the confirmation kids uh, abuse me quite, quite drastically. When I teach this to them, I always use this example. Do we read the Bible or does the Bible read us? It sounds kind of weird to say, but think of it this way. So I took my Bible... And uh, I think it was Elizabeth Larson, she, she caught a picture of it. And so I go, Does, do we read the Bible? Are we over top of it? See how I'm over top of it? Then who's the control center? Who's in authority? Me. Or am I what? Being read by the Bible. And I went like this, and I smiled, and I had this goofy smile. She snapped a picture on her cell phone. She made a meme and put colors on it and published it everywhere online. She said, this is my pastor. I'm like, great, you look like a loon, right? But... When you, when, how you view scripture, right, how you view scripture is going to then affect the control center of the church. Now look back what they said here. It says, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. Where's the authority? The Holy Spirit. Yep, the authority is going to be the Lord, right? Our triune God is the authority. And so may we, when we have struggles in church, may we look to the word and say, this, this what? This seems good to the Holy Spirit, it seems good from the Word and us. We're in, agree in agreement with the Word itself as the control center. But when the Word is not the control center, then what ends up happening? It's typically whoever has the most power and the most influence that gets what? Gets their way. Okay, any thoughts or comments on that? I'm going to pause there. Then I could feel that... Um, when I get to heaven... That uh, if they ask for who somebody who might be another, uh, like a Baptist or a different denomination. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> the important thing is their belief and their close to the Lord. You know? Well, it's interesting you mentioned like different denominations. Now, there are going to be different denominations out there, and I'll give you examples. Some, some of the conservative. The conservative um, uh, Baptist churches, they would probably, I would say for the most part, they would have the same view of Scripture as being uh, the Word of God. They would have a reverence for the Word of God. But then that would be an issue of, of interpretation. And, and they would interpret it with different lenses. And so that would be something where um, I think you can sit down with another Baptist and you can actually start right out the gates with we're all agreeing on this, which is a wonderful common starting point. And then you can duke it out on the interpretation. But if you start off with this view that this only contains the Word of God, then, boy, it's, it's difficult. It's like the Thomas Jefferson Bible. Have you heard of that before? Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, he uh, basically took a scissor to his Bible and he cut out all the miracles and anything that he didn't like. So he had a Bible that was all cut up. So he picked and, picked and uh, would choose what he wanted to actually have and what he didn't want to have. That's essentially what happens. Okay. He made himself well, yeah, in a lot of ways, he, he, made, he put himself over it. Okay, so that which governs the pastor and the church is the word of God. And so unity is had when pastors and Christians are preaching, hearing, living, and rejoicing in the same word. Okay, and so when there are great disputes of no small proportion, one dare not try and reconcile groups to each other. Okay, I want think to that, think about this real quickly here. Heavens, no, this is awful. This is wretched. Reconciliation in the church with opposing factions is never to each other, but always to each other through the word of God. So consider this little graphic here, real simple graphic. OK, 
Okay, so what can often happen is if you have two different factions, okay, so let's just split right down the center here, okay, so we have this side and this side. Let's just say that there is a dispute of no small, small proportion that arises in the church, and there's, let's just use colors, for example, it makes it really simple. You guys, what color do you, you want to advocate for? Red. Red, okay. The red tie, I like it, right? <laughs> How about this side, what color do you want to advocate for? Blue. Oh, no, this better not be political here. <laughs> no, no. Rich, Richard, what did you set yourself up for? You have people slamming their Bibles down and moving to the other side and all that, okay? But no, okay, so you have red and blue, okay? So let's just say that there's a dispute between colors of red and blue, right? And this side is absolutely, you are what, pro-red and you are anti-blue. Blue is just the most terrible color in the world. And you guys are blue is awesome, red is terrible. And there's a dispute between the two of you. Now, let's just say, for me as a pastor, I come and say, okay, here, here, here. We, we got to work this out. And so <clears throat> maybe I sit down and my goal then is to reconcile you to each other. And so then my goal might be, okay, how do I reconcile them to each other if they're stuck with red and they're stuck with blue? What you will typically advocate for is what? Purple. Purple. <laughs> That's where I was going. Yep. So, okay, maybe you're saying something but using different words. You're saying things different, different words. Okay, now you guys got to give what? You got to give a couple inches here and just be understanding. You guys got to get a little bit here and then we're going to reconcile you together and then we're going to get you what? To agree that you guys like, you know what, red is good, but purple, you know, for the sake of loving them, you can go with purple over here. I know you guys don't like red, but you know, purple still kind of looks blue, you know, so then we're going to reconcile you to all like purple and then the pastor says, yay, I did it. What happened? <laughs> nothing was accomplished. Absolutely nothing was accomplished. Okay. The church had such a fight back in the fifth, about Yep. Yep. And you see what Yep. So I'm gonna come back to that. That's 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 a great point. So what is the problem here? You're being reconciled to who? Each other. Rather than being reconciled to what? Something outside of yourself. So we don't reconcile church disputes between each other. We reconcile each group to the what? The to the word. So then let's just say that the word teaches now that's yellow. Let's just, you know, that yellow's the way. So then if it's yellow, the job of the pastor is not to reconcile you to purple. The job of the pastor is looking and say, knock it off, repent. And guess what? Knock it off and repent. It's not red. It's not blue. Repent, 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 repent. It's what? Yellow. You see what I'm saying? So this is the problem of being a pastor many times is that you, what, can get walked on from, what, both sides. But that is the job of a pastor. And you know what, frankly, that's the job of the parishioner too. And the job of the parishioner is maybe somebody over in this side of the group, okay, Grandma Jane, she just stands up and she grabs the microphone one, one day and she says, listen up! I've been on this earth over 90 years and I'm telling you, I've been reading the Word of God and it's yellow. And what? Get a line or I'm going to beat you up, right? Okay? Or re repent, right? So it's calling what? Each side to repentance. Okay? That makes sense? So what was mentioned here, Wally mentioned, is back in the uh, 50s and 60s, you had something called Seminex. What happened was liberalism was creeping into our St. Louis seminary. Now, I didn't grow up at LCMS, so I only know just a little bit of the history that I read on this. I didn't, didn't live this by any means, and I, it, I, I, many of you can maybe even tell it better, but long story short, you had professors that were going liberal, and uh, the president of, the, of the, uh, at that time, I believe was the synodical president, uh, at that time he basically said, um, either knock it off or you're fired, which was the right move. Well, long story, what happened is they ended up leaving the seminary, it's called Seminary uh, X, Seminary in Exile. So they basically, the professors and students, they all walked off the St. Louis campus, okay? Well, <clears throat> through those course of events, if my memory serves me right, there was close to 200,000 LCMS members that left the Missouri Senate over this dispute, over upholding their liberalism. That group then, okay, so that the Seminary Exile group, you had that group, later on in probably the 1980s, that group all of a sudden started to kind of drift towards who? the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America, two other Lutheran groups, and they got talking. And they said, guess what? 
let's form a new denomination. We'll call it the ELCA. So what ended up happening in the 1950s and 60s as that group left, did we become more conservative or liberal? More conservative. That group then, then merged with who? The LCA and the ALC to form the ELCA. Now, here's what's interesting. The ALC used to be what? Tight with us. So back in the day, uh, a Lutheran church in Missouri St. Pastor could go preach in their pulpit and they could come preach in our pulpit. We could all, what, commune each other's altars. But then all of a sudden, the ALC gets to be, what, buddy-buddy with that group that left. So how can we be in fellowship with them if they left our synod and they were kicked out because of their liberalism and now the ALC is buddy-buddy with them? How can we help? So then what ended up having to happen with the ALC? We had to split fellowship with them. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, what about the AALC? Is that the of the uh, AALC has all these initials. I'm sorry. The AALC is actually in fellowship with us. Right. Yep. Right. It's not to be confused with the old ALC. Right. Yeah. So unfortunately, when I was in, in the previous town of Gwinter, uh, it was an old AALC church there, and all the old timers, they, they were part of the old ALC, and they still thought we were what? In partner partnership together, and 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 theologically, those older old, older people part of the church, uh, for the most part, they were very very close to us uh, in, in, in Gwinter. But uh, what ended up happening is the affiliations aligned in such a way. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up, Wally. Okay. So does this make sense, you guys? Reconciliation is never to each other in church disputes. It's what to the word. To the word. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on for the sake of time. Now, what about the times, we're going to go um, check this idea out, when Scripture is silent on issues of dispute? Is it every man to himself? Okay? So what happens when things are neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture? What happens? Is it every man to himself? With regards to the issues neither forbidden nor commanded in the church, we do still have an ethic that we follow. Consider the following, following criteria. Number one, is a man-made tradition, okay, so now what we're talking about is things that are neither forbidden nor commanded, so now it's going to be what we call a man-made tradition. Is a man-made tradition evangelical? Does it promote or prohibit the gospel? Will this man-made tradition inadvertently undercut the doctrine of justification or promote it clearly within the church's context? And so we can have man-made traditions in the church, and we do. And that's not bad to have man-made traditions. We, we, we have traditions and man-made traditions that occur in the church. And those things, we have to ask the question, do they support the gospel? Do they encourage the preaching of the word? And do they, do they encourage the piety of the church? If they do, God be praised, right? God be praised. If they don't, then what? If they, if they obstruct the gospel, then they should be removed. Uh, this is what Luther did. He took the, uh, uh, looked at the church and he saw things such as indulgences. He saw um, the, uh, the monastic vows. He saw some of the different pilgrimages and the different almsgiving, all of those things. And he said, you know what? These are traditions of man and they are actually... Uh, impediments, they're, 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 they're standing in the way of the people hearing and receiving Jesus, so they what? They must go. That makes sense? Okay? So, when it comes to things that are neither forbidden nor commanded in the, in the church, we just simply need to look, is it, is it a blessing to the church? If it's a blessing to the church, great. Okay? Alright? Um, if it's not, if it's a if it's, uh, uh, becoming a stumbling block, then it must be what? Must be removed. Okay, number two, does this man-made tradition respect the historic faith, and does it honor the wisdom of the faithful saints that have traveled before us? Um, in my younger days as a pastor, I would look at things in the church, and I would say, oh, that's silly. And I'd say, no, we should change it. Now, what was I doing? I would say something silly that the church has upheld for what, 2,000 years on every continent in the United States, or every continent in the world, and they've upheld for hundreds and hundreds of years for millions upon millions of what? Christians. And here's me, 28 year old Pastor Richard, 
four years out of the seminary, I'm condemning all Christianity. What could we say about young Pastor Richard? Maybe even, yeah, Pastor Richard right now too. What an arrogant jerk. To presume that what? That in my short little lifespan that I'm able to what? Condemn uh, piety and, and, and different traditions in the church that have existed on every continent for thousands of years that have been a blessing to many faithful. And hear me in little tiny, little tiny, you know, Montana saying that's silly. We should stop it. Okay. Boy, that's quite a bit of arrogance there. Okay, number three. Is the, hand, is the handling of the man-made tradition handled with respect and love towards others, uh, towards one's neighbor and fellow churchmen? So if another uh, person has something that is, is a man-made tradition in the church and is promoting Christian piety, is promoting the gospel, and it's been in the tradition of the church for many years, how am I approaching that if, if I oppose it? If I'm approaching it as an arrogant jerk, condemning them and belittling them, um, am I loving? No. Am I being patient? Am I being kind? No. Okay? So this is the ethic that we follow. Okay? So below it says this. As, as so, and so as we can see from above, the goal with respect to things neither commanded nor forbidden in the church is that we promote the word, word of God without imposing further burdens on the church. With respect to the word burden, it is important to differentiate this word from the word preference. That is to say, God never forbids useful ordinances, policies, and the like in the church, as long as they work to build the church up in the word and sacraments. However, if such things burden the conscience, they are unnecessary and should be removed. And they go against a person's preference. And, and they go against a person's preference. Ah, we must be careful that we don't eliminate evangelical traditions that have promoted the gospel for centuries. What gives us the right or arrogance to toss out an evangelical tradition that is not theologically burdensome and has blessed countless saints for thousands of years on multiple continents? I'll be very, very blunt with you. That when we look through our hymnal, I can go through our hymnal and I can point out different hymns that I really like and ones that I what? Don't like. And there's some I just, you know, it's not, it's not how Peggy or Emily or Beth play it. It's just how it's written, the tune. I just don't like the tune. Now, do I have a right to put my hammer, put the hammer down and say, we're not singing the song because I don't like the way it sounds? When many people in the church who are maybe what? Blessed by it. You see what I'm saying? But how often do we do that in the American church, right? You know, we'll look at a song, I don't like the way that thing sounds, so then therefore what? We, 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 we've been not right? Okay. So we have to look at the content itself. Um, is it promoting the gospel? If it is, God be praised. Uh, is it something that is within the historic church that has blessed people and looking at our forefathers? Then God be praised. And if we, <clears throat> would, if we don't like it, how are we handling our, our piety towards our neighbor? Are we being, are we being gracious and loving? Okay. Now, we have our worship committee meetings, and I think we're very, very gracious and loving. On that, we we go out and we talk about. It. It's like, you know, sometimes Piggy's like, ah, I don't like that song, you know, and we're like, that's okay, Piggy, you don't have to like it. And then, and then uh, Piggy will make fun of me. She's like, oh, that's one of Pastor's songs that he likes. Well, guess what's happening? We're loving each other, right? We're loving each other, respecting each other on our different preferences. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Any comments or thoughts on that? Yes, Josh. You and I have talked about this, that this whole thing comes down to power versus authority. And it comes power, it just is messy and ugly. But when there's authority, like the word love for neighbor, which comes from the word, you can settle it in a wonderful way. Uh, but we are given to power all the time. And the only way to have power is to take it away from the guy next to Yep. So think about that for a second. Authority versus power, right? Power goes the way of pride. Power goes the way of control. Power goes the way of what? My way or the highway? Authority goes the way of what? God. Scripture. Authority goes, it's not about me, right? Um, submission to something bigger than myself. Um, I, I'll, I'll pull up maybe, maybe an area. I, I can't remember who in the church asked me. They came and... and uh, 
they asked me, said, what do you think about the, the paint colors in this church? Da, da, da. And I laughed. I, I said, I don't get paid enough to think that deeply. <laughs> but, but also, though, as a pastor, do I really have the authority on paint colors? No. No. Yeah. So the women should always say no, right? <laughs> okay. No, I don't. I don't have that authority. Where was the authority for that lie? It's ultimately the voters' assembly, right? Yeah. As, as, we, as we work it out together. Uh, now, do I have authority uh, on, on the scriptures? No, I, don't, I only have authority that is given to me as a pastor, and that authority is to preach and to teach, administer the sacraments, and pronounce what? Forgiveness and absolution. That's the authority I have, and that's it. Right? But power goes the way of what? Control. Power goes the way of manipulation. Power goes the way of what? Um, intimidation, so forth. It's a lot different here. What about discipline? Discipline, yeah, good question. Discipline, get this, discipline is what? Discipline can be done two different ways. Discipline can be done the way of power, which is to get vengeance for a wrong. Or discipline can be done in love, which is redemption from a wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we discipline you know, even our children, I've had to apologize to my children numerous times for the discipline I've done. Even though my discipline is correct, but I've done it with what? A really, really rotten attitude. And uh, but discipline is always done for the sake of love, for the sake of redeeming from a wrong. Okay? Yep, that's a good question. All right, let's look at, uh, uh, it says here, keep in mind that the Lord longs to burden us with the Ten Commandments, though, right? He longs to burden us, but not for the sake of condemnation, but for the sake of confession and repentance. And when we confess, the Lord God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, which is freedom. And so the church is not a place of burdened conscience, consciences, with the exception of being brought to repentance. Instead, the church is a place of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Woe to pastors and churches that place unnecessary burdens on members, burdens that do not come forth from the word of God, as well as burdens that do not lead to the freedom of repentance and confession. Okay? So the point that we're seeing here is we, the church, and I'll be very blunt here, for us, the St. Paul's, we can end up in a lot of troubles and a lot of fighting in the church if Pastor Richard deviates from the word, if you deviate from the word. We can end up in a lot, a lot of problems if we do not respect our proper, what, lanes and vocations and so forth. That makes sense? Um, so we, 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 we give authority, as was mentioned before, we give authority to different people to do different things in this church. And what typically can happen is if we're not in our proper lanes, then we can have conflict, okay? But ultimately when it comes down for the church, and as we think about Acts 15, it comes back to that council. As, as they said, it seemed right, as they said, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden. And so <clears throat> when it comes theologically, we our control center is the Word of God, and with things that are not our control center, we, we, we simply look at some of those principles. Does it promote the gospel? Is it evangelical, Okay. Or does it impose, right, the gospel? The, uh, impose on it? Um, does it respect the traditions of our past and those who have come before us? And is it loving? Are we being loving to each other? Okay? Okay, any thoughts on that as we kind of wrap this up? Yes, Dwayne. Uh, going back to uh, the Bible where it says, uh, this is the word of God or this contains the word of God. Like you said, the Baptists believe that it is the Word of God. Okay? Yep. Uh, take the Catholic Bible, I'm sure they believe it's the Word of God too. But if you've got the Apocrypha in there, now, does it contain the Word of God? I would say that uh, the Apocrypha is useful and good for reading, but it is not on the same level as the Word of God. Yeah, um, that's, that's my understanding yep. too, but, uh, you know. Yep. I'm not sure exactly how the Catholics would respond to that. Uh, so what, what Duane is referring to is called the Apocrypha. It's the, the books of the Bible, or not the books of the Bible, the books that go between uh, Malachi and Matthew. There's about a 400-year time period from Malachi, uh, the last book of the Old Testament, and the book of Matthew, about 400 years. So the book he's re books he re he's referring to are those books that, that span in the center. Um, I'm trying to think how the Reformers handled it. 
I'm, I'm trying to recall exactly how Martin Luther handled it. He, he actually did include, I think in Luther's Bible, the Apocrypha was included, but I believe it was like almost like an appendix, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that it was included in the Bible. It was in the back of the appendix that they would have it. I'm not sure, though, off the top of my head. So, <clears throat> yeah, so when it comes to that, think about this here, too. When I say, um, you know, I read the scripture on Sundays, okay, like today, and I'll get done with reading the book of um, today. It's from Second Chronicles. So I get done reading Second Chronicles. I said, this is the word of Matt Richard. No, but this is what? This is the word of the Lord. And what do you say? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Notice how I don't stand up and say, this contains the word of God. Thanks be to God. You know, right? This is the word of God. This is the word of the God. Word of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah? Well, you, you end up, you end up, here's the problem is this, is if you start throwing some things out, we have to understand scripture interprets scriptures, scripture, and scripture is woven together because there's one author of the, of the scripture, and it's Christ. And so when we start taking one part out, <clears throat> then we mess in other parts. I remember having a conversation with an ELCA pastor, and he was saying to me something to the effect, well, the book of Jonah is allegorical. It's allegorical. In other words, it's not a real person, it's more of a story, like a parable. And, and okay, now, now we have a problem because Jesus speaks about Jonah in the Gospels, and he doesn't speak about Jonah as if he was a mythological figure. Okay, as a mythological figure. And so he speaks about Jonah as a real person, time, place, and so forth. So now all of a sudden, if we think that Jonah is allegorical, then we have to reinterpret how Jesus spoke about Jonah, and now what we keep on. Then here's the other thing. Well, ultimately what it came down to this ELC pastor is he thought it was foolishness. Oh, it's just foolishness that a guy could be swallowed by a great fish and survive three days and be coughed up on the land. That's just, that just sounds, that sounds ridiculous. And my response was this. Uh... I'm not a betting man, but if I'm going to bet, and I'm going to take what? A guy being swallowed by a fish, or a guy being crucified on a cross, speared in the side with blood and water coming forth, uh, uh, basically beaten bloody to a pulp, and then shoved in a tomb for three days. And I'm going to look at both of those. Um, I think I have a lot easier time believing that Jonah could be coughed up than Jesus could rise from the grave. So if Jonah couldn't be coughed up from a fish, that's impossible, then how on earth would it be possible for Christ to rise from the grave? You see what I'm saying? You've got an ideological, big ideological problem there. Ah, uh, that can't happen, being coughed up from a fish. Okay, well, if I'm a bet man, I'm going to put my money on Jonah surviving versus Jesus. Now all of a sudden you've, what, started to unravel the whole thing. Okay? Okay, yes? You know, that's a good point. Um, as a way to conclude here, um, what, what Doris brings up. If you want to know what your pastors, okay, so it be me, Roth, Birch, so forth, and going back. If you want to know the pastor's agenda, okay, we all, we all have agendas. I have an agenda. If you want to read about my agenda, you open the book of Concord. That's my agenda. We as a church, we have been so bold to take what we're about and what we're trying to do and what our goal is in the church and we put it in a book called the Book of Concord and we made it available for everybody to see. So, Pastor Richard, you don't mean this. Yeah, I do. It's printed right here. That's exactly what, we baptize babies. Absolutely, right? It's, why, it's right there in the Book of Concord. That's beautiful, isn't it? And so the agenda, right, the way that we confess, the, how we understand, is all there in the Book of Concord for us to see uh, clearly. Yes, Barbara? And the Book of Concord is based on the Bible itself. Yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> so think of it this way, uh, as a way, we've got to wrap up here, but think of it this way. We have the Bible, right? Uh, this is the Bible. This is our source of authority, our control center. But what do we confess that this is all about? 
That's what the book of Concord is. It's what we actually confess. It's how we read this. It's what we understand what's important in this. We, this is what we understand what, what this is all about. And so that's what the book of Concord is. It's our confession, right? It's what do we say that this is about? What is the main theme of this Bible? What is going on? What is the purpose of this Bible? It's all printed in what we call the Book of Concord. Yep. And then, how do we act that piety out? And how do we live that? We live it with what? Our hymnal. It's right here. This is the hymnal that we use on Sundays. It's the hymnal that pastor takes to the hospitals to do pastoral visits. It's the hymnal, the hymnal that we can use in our homes. Right? All transparent. Okay? All right, let's uh, stand and pray. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, thanks, you guys.